Introduction The following is an article by H.A. Ironside regarding the dangers of Bax, 28 Dispensationalism. Eric Newman has analyzed this article and provided his comments in bold. The comments appear as a parenthetical reference right after the material that is being commented on. H.A. Ironside is an X2 Dispensationalist, while Eric Newman does not subscribe to either of these views. He is a Bible believer, who accepts the Bible as his final authority over all else. For the most part, Ironside's paper, although written a few generations ago, contains the basic tenets and arguments of fundamental Christianity today against Bible believers. By reading Eric's comments, you will see the immense difference that exists between what God's Word says and what Christianity teaches. This difference exists because Christianity mostly contains human viewpoint with scripture taken out of context to support what man says, in contrast to believing the word of God. As such, Jesus' critique of the Pharisees applies today, full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition, Mark 7 verse 9. Eric's comments should instruct readers to take the Bible as their final authority, believe it over what anyone says, including the most respected biblical scholars and pastors around, and rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. By saying that the present dispensation began at Acts 2, rather than at Acts 9, Ironside, and mainstream Christianity, are wrongly dividing the word of truth, leading to many serious and false doctrinal positions that have made Christianity out to be hypocritical, leading the world into the pit of hell, rather than being the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, that God called the church to be. Wrongly dividing the word of truth. Ultra dispensationalism examined in the light of Holy Scripture, by H.A. Ironside, Doctor of Literature 1. What is ultra dispensationalism? 2. The four gospels and their relation to the church. 3. The transitional period. Point 6. 8. Including remarks. 18. Is the Church of the Acts the body of Christ? Point 42. 4. When was the revelation of the mystery of the one body given? 58. 5. Further examination of the epistles. 6. Is the Church the Bride of the Lamb? Point 78. 92. 7. Do baptism and the Lord's Supper have any place in the present dispensation of the grace of God? 112, 146. Chapter 1. What is ultra dispensationalism? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Paul's exhortation to the younger preacher, Timothy, has come home to many with great power in recent years. As a result, there has been a return to more ancient methods of Bible study, which had been largely neglected during the centuries of the Church's drift from apostolic testimony. Note that the emphasis is placed on apostolic testimony, when he should have said the Church's drift from the truth of God's Word. Augustine's words have had a reaffirmation, distinguish the ages, and the scriptures are plain. We are not following Augustine in right division. Rather, we are following the words of our Lord Jesus Christ given to us through Paul. We are also following the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rightly divided Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 3 between the two comings of the Messiah, see Luke 4 verses 16 to 21, dot. And so there has been great emphasis put in many quarters, and rightly so, upon the study of what is commonly known as dispensational truth. This line of teaching, if kept within scriptural bounds, in what way does the mid-Acts position go outside scriptural bounds, cannot but prove a great blessing to the humble student of the Word of God who desires to know His will, Paul said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. Therefore, I learn God's will in what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, who will have all men to be saved, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. I do not need to pray for hours on end until I receive an unction of the Spirit to go somewhere or do something for God. Rather, I trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in order to be saved, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3-4, and I consider what Paul says, 
which is to read God's word rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, in order to come unto the knowledge of the truth, or plan in his dealings with men from creation to the coming glory, God's plan has already been accomplished through the cross work of Christ. It is finished, John 19 verse 30. God is just waiting for man to believe God in what he has already finished. A careful examination of the volume of Revelation shows that God's ways with men have differed in various ages. This must be taken into account if one would properly apprehend his truth. The word dispensation is found several times in the pages of our English Bible and is a translation of the Greek word oikonomia. This word, strictly speaking, means house order. It might be translated administration, order, or stewardship. Why appeal to the Greek? Why not just let the preserved word of God in English speak for itself in the King James Version? In each successive age, note how Ironside gives you the Greek definition of dispensation, then he uses a modern Bible perversion by saying age, which lends credence to the new AGE movement and to the use of new Bible versions. God gives to men of faith a certain stewardship, or makes known to them a certain order or administration, in accordance with which they are responsible to behave. I would argue that they are responsible to believe, not behave, since salvation is always by faith. Regardless of the dispensation, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 verse 6. A dispensation then is a period of time in which God is dealing with men in some way in which he has not dealt with them before. Only when a new revelation from God is given, does a dispensation change. Such occurred with Paul, the gospel, which was preached of me, is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1, 11 b 12. A dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17. Moreover, there may be degrees of revelation in one dispensation, all, however, having to do with a fuller unfolding of the will of God for that particular age, yes, there is progressive revelation from God within dispensations. But, how does Ironside distinguish between a new revelation and degrees of revelation? This was very definitely true in the dispensation of law, from Moses to Christ. How was the giving of the law a new dispensation when God had already started the nation of Israel in Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3 and declared that Israel is my son, even my firstborn in Exodus 4 verse 22? Since the law was just a continuation of the nation of Israel, we must say that the law is a degree of revelation within Israel's dispensation. Therefore, Ironside does not even get one sentence out without going against what he said in the previous two sentences. We have the various revelations of Sinai, both the first and second giving of the law, then added instructions during the wilderness years, the covenant with David, and the revelations given to the prophets. The circumstances in which God's people were found changed frequently during this age of law, but the dispensation itself continued from Sinai until Jesus cried, it is finished. How did Jesus end the dispensation of law at this time? He told his disciples, the scribes, and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, Matthew 23, 2-3a, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, Matthew 28, 20a. Thus, Jesus told the disciples to obey the law, and to teach the Gentiles to obey the law after Jesus cried it is finished. In fact, as late as Acts 21 verse 20, we still see Jews following the law, as Jesus commanded them. Thou sayest, Brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Therefore, it is finished is not a reference to the Mosaic law. Rather, it is a reference to something much greater. The payment for sin has been made. It is important to have this in mind. Otherwise the vast scope of an ever-unfolding dispensation may be lost sight of, apparently, Ironside did not keep this in mind, because he thinks that God started a new dispensation with Moses, when God started Israel's dispensation with Abraham in Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3 and continued that dispensation until Acts 9. And one might get the idea that every additional revelation of truth in a given age changed the dispensation, whereas it only enlarges it. One may illustrate a dispensation in a very simple way, remembering that the word really means house order, and I might add, the Greek word has been anglicized, and we know it as economy. 
No, I know the word dispensation as dispensation because that is what the Bible says it is. Ironside is trying to make you think that dispensations are made up by man. When the word is used four times in scripture, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, Ephesians 1 verse 10, Ephesians 3 verse 2, Colossians 1 verse 25. Note that the word is only used by Paul because the big dispensational break between prophecy and mystery occurs with Paul's writings. Let us suppose a young woman whom we will call Mary is going out into service. She obtains a position in a humble home belonging to a good family of the working class. There are certain rules governing that home which she must learn to observe. All, perhaps, is not plain to her at once, but as time goes on, she learns more and more fully the desires of her mistress. We will say she is to rise at five every morning and begin to prepare the breakfast and put up the lunches for those who go out to work. At six, she is to ring the rising bell. At half past six, the family are supposed to be at the breakfast table, and at seven they leave for work. Dinner of course is at a certain hour at night, and in the meantime, she has her different duties to perform in keeping the house in order. She learns quite thoroughly the domestic economy of this particular home and becomes a well-qualified household servant. Now let us suppose that later on, she finds that a cook and housekeeper is needed for the large mansion on the hill. She applies for the position and is accepted. Moving in, her mistress undertakes to instruct her in the economy, the new home. But Mary says, you need not give me any instructions, ma'am, I know exactly how a house should be run. Just leave it to me and everything will be attended to properly. I have had some years of experience in housekeeping and I would not have asked for the position if I did not know what was required. Her mistress is dubious, but for the time being acquiesces. The next morning, the waking gong sounds at six o'clock. The family, who are accustomed to bankers' hours during the day and are given to very late hours at night, are astonished and chagrined at being aroused so early. The mistress calls down to the housekeeper, what does this mean, and learns that breakfast will be on the table in half an hour. Why, Mary? She exclaims, we never breakfast here until half past eight. But the breakfast is hot and the lunches are all ready, ma'am. No one carries lunches in this home. You see, Mary, you do not understand the arrangement here. I shall have to instruct you carefully today. And poor bewildered Mary learns the importance of dispensational truth. The illustration, I know, is crude, but I think anyone will see the point. God had one order for the house of Israel. There is another order for the house of God, is Ironside saying that the house of Israel is not part of the house of God, and that they do not have eternal life like we do? Is he also saying that Gentiles, in Israel's dispensation, are not saved? House of God is found 87 times in the Bible. 81 of these are in the Old Testament and only one mention is given in Paul's epistles. All saved people, including Israel, are part of the house of God. Better terms of distinction would be prophecy dispensation and mystery dispensation or Israel's program and the body of Christ, the church of the living God today. There will be a different order in the millennial age. Where does Ironside get that there will be a different order in the millennial age? The millennial age is not a new dispensation, but it is a continuation of Israel's program. God told Israel under Moses that, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, and an holy nation, Exodus 19 verse 6. Then, in the millennial kingdom, God says that the Gentiles will call Israel the priests of the Lord, Isaiah 61 verse 6. And there have been varying orders in the past. All this comes out clearly in the pages of Holy Scripture. If it comes out clearly in the pages of Holy Scripture, then why didn't Ironside give verses to support his statements, as I did with mine, and is certainly involved in the expression in our English Bibles, rightly dividing the word of truth. Of course, this expression is not by any means to be limited to dispensational teaching. It also implies putting each great doctrine of the word in its right place. If each great doctrine of the word needs to be put in its right place, what is its right place if it is not within dispensations? In other words, what other categories does Ironside have that are included in rightly dividing that he is not telling us about? It has been translated, cutting in a straight line the word of truth, that is, not confounding or confusing things that differ, things that differ? Is Ironside borrowing from Stam here? So, by Ironside's own admission, 
There are things that differ in scripture, and they must be put in their right place, because different scripture are not always saying the same things. Yet, these right places are not dispensations, but are some other, abstract designation not divulged by Ironside. It even suggests the thought of honestly facing the word of truth. How does Ironside get honestly facing the word of truth out of rightly dividing the word of truth? These are two, completely different ideas. That is not to say that we should not honestly face the word of truth, but that idea comes from 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12 and 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 and 4 colon 6, not from 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. Ironside thinks people will believe what he says just because he says it. He does not seem to need to support his ideas with scripture. But, we should ask the question, what saith the scripture? Romans 4 verse 3. It is right here then that we need to be careful and not read into the word of God ideas out of our own minds which are not really there. As I have pointed out, that is exactly what Ironside has done. Through doing this, some have ignored dispensational truth altogether. Others have swung to an ultra-dispensationalism which is most pernicious in its effect upon one's own soul and upon testimony for God generally. Of these ultra-dispensational systems, one in particular has come into prominence of late years, which, for want of a better name, is generally called Bullingerism, owing to the fact that it was first advocated some years ago by Drive E. W. Bullinger, a clergyman of the Church of England. These views have been widely spread through the notes of the Companion Bible, a work partly edited by Dr. Bullinger, though he died before it was completed. All of the notes in the Companion Bible come from Bullinger. It's just that the latter part of the New Testament's notes were added after his death from Bullinger's other writings. This Bible has many valuable features and has been a help in certain respects to God's servants, thou art no more a servant, but a son, Galatians 4 verse 7, who have used it conservatively, but it contains interpretations which are utterly subversive of the truth. Note that Ironside will only argue against an Acts 28 position, while ignoring the mid-Acts position that he was really opposed to. We should also note that, while Bullinger held to an Acts 28 position, most of Bullinger's notes in the Companion Bible have to do with cross-references, alternate word meanings, and historical information, rather than being a defense of his Acts 28 position. Furthermore, most of Bollinger's writings support a mid-Acts position with the exception of his last work, The Foundations of Dispensational Truth. For example, his overview of Paul's epistles is outlined from a mid-Acts position. Some of Dr. Bollinger's positions are glaringly opposed to what is generally accepted as orthodox teaching. Just because a teaching is not orthodox does not mean it is not the truth. As, for instance, the sleep of the soul between death and resurrection, yes, this is a false doctrine. And it is a most significant fact that while he did not apparently fully commit himself to any eschatological position as to the final state of the impenitent, most of his followers in Great Britain have gone off into annihilation, another false doctrine, and there is quite a sect in America who began with his teaching who now are restorationists of the broadest type, teaching what they are pleased to call universal reconciliation, which to their minds involves the final salvation not only of all men, but of Satan and all the fallen angels. Another false doctrine. However, if you take the Bible as your final authority, you will reject all of these false doctrines. These two views, diverse as they are, are nevertheless the legitimate offspring of the ultra-dispensational system to which we refer. The present writer has been urged by many for years to take up these questions, but has always heretofore shrunk from doing so, first, because of the time and labor involved, which seemed out of all proportion to the possible value of such an examination, how is there little value to such an examination, if the doctrine Ironside is against is so contrary to the truth of God's word for today? The real reason Ironside shrunk from doing so is because he was a mid. Acts dispensationalist until he realized he would have a bigger following if he changed to an Acts 2 position. For example, in Ironside's Lectures on Colossians, page 57, he states that a special revelation was given not to the Twelve, but to Paul as the Apostle of the New Dispensation. He also states in Mysteries of God, page 74, to the epistles of Paul alone do we turn for the revelation of this mystery. Paul, as one born out of due time, was selected to be the messenger to the nations, 
announcing the distinctive truths of the present dispensation. And secondly, because of a natural shrinking from controversy, remembering the word, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That verse refers to being patient with ignorant brethren in your church. However, when church leaders are into false doctrine, it must be immediately and harshly dealt with. For example, when Paul saw Peter's error, Paul said, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed, Galatians 2 verse 11. When Paul saw false doctrine being taught by Hymenaeus and Alexander, he delivered them unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme, 1 Timothy 1 verse 20. Dot. But the rapid spread of these pernicious views and their evident detrimental effect upon so many who hold them has led to the conclusion that it would be unfaithfulness to God and to his people if one refused to seek to give any help he could in regard to these teachings. Briefly, then, what are the outstanding tenets of Bollingerism and its kindred systems? For one needs to remember that a number are teaching these ultra-dispensational things who declare that they are not familiar with the writings of Dr. Bollinger and repudiate with indignation the name of Bollingerism. There are perhaps six outstanding positions taken by these teachers. First, inasmuch as our Lord Jesus was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made to the fathers, it is insisted that the four Gospels are entirely Jewish and have no real message for the Church, the body of Christ. Jesus said, Salvation is of the Jews. John 4 verse 22 is that the message that Ironside wants us to tell people today? Why would we when Jesus tells us through Paul that today, there is neither Jew nor Greek, in Christ Jesus? Galatians 3 verse 28 There must have been a dispensational change since the Gospels. Besides, Ironside stated that the dispensation of law went from Moses to Jesus cry from the cross of it is finished. If that is true, then, by Ironside's own admission, the Gospels are not written to us today because they belong to the dispensation of law. Why does Ironside go to the trouble of an illustration of house order, explaining what a dispensation is, and then he turns right around and is guilty of trying to follow instructions that, by his own admission, belong to a previous dispensation or house order? All might not put it quite as boldly as this, but certainly their disciples go to the limit in repudiating the authority of the Gospels. If the Gospels belong to the dispensation of law, but Ironside tries to apply them today, why, then, does Ironside repudiate the authority of the Levitical law? Does he keep from marring the corners of his beard, Leviticus 19 verse 27? Does he make sure his clothes are only made of one fiber, Leviticus 19 verse 19? If he touches a dead body, does he stay away from the temple for seven days and purify himself on the third day, Numbers 19, 11-13? Christians do not follow these laws because they say that Christ did away with them. So, when we are told that Jesus Christ called Paul, Acts 9 verse 15, revealed to him a gospel, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12, and made him the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, we should come to the same conclusion not to follow the Gospels, because they have been replaced by Christ by the mystery given to Paul, Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 6. Secondly, it is maintained that the book of Acts covers a transition period between the dispensation of the law and the dispensation of the mystery, that is, that in the book of Acts we do not have the church, the body of Christ, but that the word ecclesia, church, or assembly, as used in that book, refers to a different church altogether to that of Paul's prison epistles. This earlier church is simply an aspect of the kingdom and is not the same as the body of Christ. A church is merely a group of believers. Most people would say that the church started in Acts 2. However, Acts 7 verse 38 tells us that the church existed in the wilderness back in Exodus. Therefore, the church started where there was a group of believers, which was way before Acts 2. Do not let Christianity fool you into believing that the church is the same thing as the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a term that refers specifically to all believers in the current dispensation. The term appears four times in Scripture, Romans 7 verses 4 and 1 Corinthians 10 16, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27, and Ephesians 4 verse 12, and all of those appearances are in Paul's epistles, because it did not exist until God started it with the Apostle Paul. 
God started the body of Christ with Paul in Acts 9, as a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. But, this is not a different church altogether. All believers are part of God's church and kingdom. Whether a person is part of God's earthly kingdom or God's heavenly kingdom depends on the dispensation one is in, but they are all part of God's church or eternal kingdom. Third, it is contended that Paul did not receive his special revelation of the mystery of the body until his imprisonment in Rome, and that his prison epistles alone reveal this truth and are, strictly speaking, the only portion of the Holy Scriptures given to members of the body. All of the other epistles of Paul, save those written during his imprisonment and the general epistles, Paul did not write any general epistles. Ironside wrongly attributes the writing of the book of Hebrews to Paul, are relegated to the earlier dispensation of the book of Acts, and have no permanent value for us, but were for the instruction of the so-called Jewish church of that time. This is the Acts 28 position. A mid-Acts position, which I hold, states that all of Paul's epistles are written to us today. The Gospel is not found in the prison epistles, Ephesians, Colossians, because they are advanced doctrine for saved people who have already learned doctrine found in Romans. So, those taking an Acts 28 view do not know how to be saved today. Fourth, the entire book of Revelation has to do with the coming age and has no reference to the church today. Even the letters to the seven churches in Asia, which are distinctly said to be the things which are, are, according to this system. To be considered as the things which are not, and will not be until the church, the body of Christ, is removed from this world. Then, it is contended, these seven churches will appear on the earth as Jewish churches in the Great Tribulation. The seven churches existed in John's day, and so they were in existence at the writing of Revelation, near and partial fulfillment. They will also be in existence in the future tribulation, full and complete fulfillment. Revelation 1 verse 1 says the revelation is for his sins. Leviticus 25 verse 55 says, The children of Israel are servants, they are my servants. Today, in the dispensation of grace, we are sons. Galatians 4 verse 7 says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. Therefore, Revelation is not written to us today, but it is written to Israel, for after the rapture of the church. Furthermore, an objective reading of the book of Revelation reveals that it is Jewish in nature. For example, Revelation 7 verses 1 to 8 specifically lists the 12 tribes of Israel as being sealed. Revelation 21 verse 12 says that New Jerusalem has the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel written on it. If it is written to us today, then God is only saving Jews today, and only Jews will be in the New Jerusalem. This goes against what Paul says in Romans 2 verse 11 that there is no respect of persons with God in today's dispensation of grace, because God has broken down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile, Ephesians 2 verse 14. This middle wall of partition is back up in Revelation, which means Revelation must pertain to Israel's program only, not to us today. Fifth, the body of Christ is altogether a different company, according to these teachers, from the bride of the Lamb, the latter being supposed to be Jewish. Would not Christ's body be different from his bride? Even the greatest idiots of our day know that a man's body is different from a woman's body. The term body of Christ is only found in Paul's epistles. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27 says, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. Bride is in the Bible 14 times, and all occurrences are outside of Paul's epistles. Furthermore, Revelation 21 clearly states that the bride of the Lamb is New Jerusalem. Since its gates have the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, Revelation 21 verse 14, would not this make Israel the bride of the Lamb? In fact, Isaiah 62 verse 4 says that God will marry the land of Israel. Therefore, the biblical evidence supports Christ's body being different from his bride, and that Christ's body is comprised of saved people today, while his bride is comprised of saved Israel in Israel's program. Sixth, the Christian ordinances. What are these Christian ordinances, and when were they given? I would assume he is referring to water baptism and the Lord's Supper. However, Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. Why, then, should we baptize when Christ said not to do it today? 
With regard to the Lord's Supper, that practice continues today, and 1 Corinthians 11 verses 17 to 34 gives rules for it, but we also see the Lord partaking of a supper with his disciples just before his death, and he will partake with them again in the kingdom at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Therefore, even the Lord has supper with saved people from both dispensations, having been given before Paul, since they were both given in the Gospels, and those Gospels, by Ironside's own admission, belong to a previous dispensation, why would Ironside call them Christian and attempt to observe them today? For example, does Ironside obey the Mosaic law when a man was sick and becomes well in his church? Does he inspect the man and then kill a bird and a lamb in his church, among other things, as Jesus instructed the healed leper to have done in Matthew 8 verse 4 in accordance with the law, see Leviticus 14 verses 1 to 32, is supposed to have received his revelation of the mystery in prison, have no real connection with the present economy, and therefore, are relegated to the past, and may again have a place in the future great tribulation asterisk, by saying that they are not relevant today, Ironside is trying to get his audience outraged at this position, because he is implying that those who see the mystery dispensation are saying not to follow what Jesus said. However, we do follow what Jesus said, because what Paul wrote came from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, Galatians 1 verse 12, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, which is even more authoritative than Matthew John, because Jesus' words in Paul's epistles came from Jesus after God had begotten Jesus as his son, Acts 13 verse 33, and made him both Lord and Christ, Acts 2 verse 36, as opposed to what Jesus said in Matthew John. Before he had triumphed over Satan's forces through the cross, Colossians 2 verse 15. Asterisk as to this, these ultra-dispensationalists differ. Most of them reject water baptism entirely for this age. Good for them. All of them are not prepared to go so far in connection with the Lord's Supper, but many of them repudiate it too. I do not see why they repudiate the Lord's Supper, in light of 1 Corinthians 11 verses 17 to 34 but they certainly should repudiate the cruel mocking of the Lord's Supper that most churches observe with a bite of cracker and a sip of grape juice. I will say more on this later. Besides these six points, there are many other unscriptural things. By saying other unscriptural things, Ironside implies that the first six points are unscriptural as well. Yet, I have quoted many scriptures to show that my views are backed up by scripture. Where are Ironside's quotes of scripture to prove his points? which are advocated by various disciples who began with these views and have been rapidly throwing overboard other scriptural teachings. Many Bullingerites boldly advocate the sleep of the soul between death and resurrection, the annihilation of the wicked, or, as we have seen, universal salvation of all men and demons, the denial of the eternal sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ, and, gravest of all, the personality of the Holy Spirit. A mid position does not support these doctrines, as they are all false. No position should be abandoned just because some people stray from the truth of God's word to believe corrupt doctrine. By Ironside's argument, then, we should abandon the whole Bible, because most churches twist God's word to fit their fleshly desires. All of these evil doctrines find congenial soil in Bollingerism. Once men take up with this system, there is no telling how far they will go and what their final position will be in regard to the great fundamental truths of Christianity. It is because of this that one needs to be on his guard, for it is as true of systems as it is of teachers, by their fruits ye shall know them. All systems of Christianity should be abandoned. Instead, we should follow God and his word. That way, when a system strays from the truth of God's word, we will not be led astray by it. I am a dispensationalist, because believing God's word requires me to recognize that God gave different instructions to different people for different time periods. In fact, scripture teaches that Jesus was also a dispensationalist. Luke 4 verses 18 to 19 records Jesus reading Isaiah 61, 1-2a, but he closes the book before finishing the rest of verse 2 and all of verse 3 because he recognizes that the latter part of the passage will not be fulfilled until a later time. Therefore, Jesus rightly divides between his first and second comings. I use the term dispensationalist, because the Bible uses that term, not because some man uses it. 
1 Corinthians 9 verse 17 specifically says, A dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. I use the term the mystery, because that is also a Bible term, as Romans 16 verse 25 says that Paul preached the revelation of the mystery. I do not learn the things of God by reading commentaries, studying the original languages, reading the early church fathers, or using a hermeneutical system. Rather the system I use is the one that God set up. That system is that, once I trusted in the finished work of Christ for eternal life, God gave me the mind of Christ, 1 Cor. 2.16, and the Holy Spirit, who teaches me the things of God as I read and believe the scripture, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 14. Since the Holy Spirit is the teacher and, by their fruits ye shall know them, the fruit that comes from believing the Bible is love, etc., Galatians 5 verse 22. So, forget Bollingerism and Ironsidism and believe God and his word instead. Having had most intimate acquaintance with Bollingerism as taught by many for the last 40 years, I have no hesitancy in saying that its fruits are evil. I do not defend Bollingerism. I defend God's word, which is what Ironside is really attacking. Ironside just likes to label his attack as one against Bollingerism. That way, he is attacking a man-made system, rather than attacking God himself and his word. It has produced a tremendous crop of heresies throughout the length and breadth of this and other lands. It has divided Christians and wrecked churches and assemblies without number. It has lifted up its votaries in intellectual and spiritual pride to an appalling extent, so that they look with supreme contempt upon Christians who do not accept their peculiar views, and in most instances where it has been long tolerated. It has absolutely throttled gospel effort at home and sown discord on missionary fields abroad. The Acts 28 position does have its problems, but it is closer to the truth than an Acts 2 position. The Acts 2 position, of which Ironside is a proponent of, does not have a clear gospel message, because Acts 2 verse 38 says that you must repent and be baptized in order to be saved. Yet 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17 says that Christ did not send Paul to baptize but to preach the gospel. By putting both Acts 2 verse 38 and 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17 in the same dispensation, Acts 2 people do not even know how to be saved. They also take the Great Commission of Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20 to apply to themselves today, so that they have excuses to be missionaries. There are two problems with this. 1. This commission was put on hold by the dispensation of grace, as the apostles of Israel's dispensation readily agree to confine their ministry to saved Jews only, Galatians 2 verse 9, and 2, the Gospel of Matthew 28 verse 20 is to teach the Gentiles the Mosaic Law. It does not contain the message of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins. Since Acts 2 dispensationalists do not preach a clear, Gospel message, they follow the Pharisees by compassing sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold the child of hell than yourselves, Matthew 23 verse 15. So true are these things of this system that I have no hesitancy in saying it is an absolutely satanic perversion of the truth. As just shown, an Acts 2 position is an absolutely satanic perversion of the truth. In fact, Paul says that those preaching it are ministers of Satan, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 13 to 15, and they are to be accursed for preaching a false gospel, Galatians 1 verses 6 to 9. Instead of rightly dividing the word, I shall seek to show that these teachers wrongly divide the word, and that their propaganda is anything but conducive to spirituality and enlightenment in divine things.